had a nice vacation. Okay, so I think we're going to start. Okay, I no problem. I missed learning a little bit. What, you missed learning a little bit? I missed this class, happens to be. I enjoy teaching you guys so much. Um, this is, I have to take this with me, carry this with me, because um, I do move around. Can you put it in your pocket, I guess? I so don't, do I have a pocket? Sure pocket okay. Oh, a sure pocket? Sure. Okay, sure. Okay, great. So, welcome back everybody to class. We are continuing our story of crisis and continuity in Spartan history. If you remember, before we took our break, we were looking at the crisis that occurred in the Sparta Jewish community, and that is to say Jews in Muslim lands. We looked at political crises. We looked at a social crisis. We looked at the development of anti-Semitism in the Ottoman world and the repercussions it had beginning with the Damascus blood libel. Today, I want to go back in time and look at an absolutely bizarre, fascinating, crazy story that had an enormous impact not only on the Sephardic world, but on the Ashkenaz world at all, as well. And this is a particular type of crisis that we're going to call a messianic crisis. Another reason that we see the decline of the Sephardic world is because of this bizarre story that, again, continues to have repercussions to this day in the most amazing ways. And this is the crisis that we're going to call the crisis of Shabtai Tzvi, false messiah, false Mashiach. So much to say. I will tell you that in graduate school, I took a seminar on this course. And it was so fascinating that we actually requested the teacher continue, extend the discussion, which she could not do. But there is so much to discuss. I have a distinct feeling that today's topic will take us into next week as well, when we look at the afterlife of Shaktai Tzvi. And so today we begin with the events of what happened back in the 17th century. And next week we will continue. I know I've said to you that each week stands alone, but I do think that today's topic will take us into next week as well. But let's see how much we can do. For those of you who came late, here we have the sheets. I, I, I feel bad giving you Musar, but try to come 1045, only because I teach at 12 and I need a little time for lunch. So try and come on time. OK, so let's talk about our title here, the fascinating story of Shaktai Tzvi, false Mashiach. Let's talk about the word Messiah. Why is the word Messiah so important for Jews? Anyone? What's the concept of Mashiach? Yeah, the concept of Messiah is one of the basic beliefs. In fact, it's one of the Yudgimel Ikare and Muna according to Maimonides. We all know that Rambam lists 13 principles of faith that we all believe in. One of them is, you all know it in the formulation of the famous Ani Mamin, Ani Mamin Bemuna Shlem Vyata Mashiach, Vyata Pishit Mamea, Imkoza Hakelo Bokoyam Sheyavo. Maimonides says you can't really be considered a good Jew unless you believe in the Messiah. We have always believed in the Messiah. The idea that ultimately there will be a final redemption and we will be returned to our ancestral homeland, to Eretz Yisrael. There will be a period of eternal peace and prosperity, etc. So this has been a basic belief since time immemorial, since Judaism began as a religion. We have had false messiahs before. Who remembers anything they've learned in Jewish history where Jews actually believed that the messiah was at hand and then it turned out to be a fake story? Anybody? Oh, excellent. So Masada has to do with the destruction of the Second Temple when Jews actually gave up. That was the last stronghold of the Jews in the Great Revolt. And in the year 73 BC, they supposedly, according to Josephus, committed mass suicide. But that doesn't have to do necessarily with a messianic story, although there were Jews who believed that maybe now with all the suffering of the Roman times, it was time to revolt and the Mashiach would come. So there is an element of messianic wishful thinking in the era of the Great Revolt. But does anybody Wasn't remember Yeshi learning? Oh, excellent. Messiah? Jesus is a false messiah from the Jewish point of view. Exactly. We have a major world religion created on the idea that Jesus, later the idea that he was the son of God, but that he's the messianic figure, the savior who will save the world. We certainly don't believe in that. Are there any other messiahs that you can think of from ancient Jewish history who Bar Kokhba, famous example of Bar Kokhba, is in the second century, CE, we have a Jew who comes along, Bar Kokhba, Shimon Bar Koziva, who claims that he's the Messiah, and almost the entire Jewish people stand behind him, including the very greatest of the sages of that day. Anybody know? Rabbi Akiva, who believed that Bar Kokhba was his was the savior, and in fact may even have joined the forces, revolutionary forces. He may have been his standard bearer. He actually carried Bar Kokhba's arms. Other rabbis said, not so fast. 
And what do we know happened to Bar Kokhba? While he's initially successful in ejecting the Romans from Jerusalem, and while there's some intriguing evidence that he may even have begun to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash and offer sacrifices, we all know that after two and a half years, the Romans succeeded in quashing the rebellion, killing Bar Kokhba, and why are we talking about this when we're talking about a 16th century Messiah? Because here's the fascinating thing. Bar Kokhba was a very great man. In fact, Maimonides tells us that Bar Kokhba may have been the Messiah. He may actually have been the real Mashiach, but, Mr. Dwight, you remember? He messed up. He believed He believed that it was his own strength that caused this great victory. And God said, really, I'm going to show you, you do need a little bit of my help here. And Bar Kokhba was cruelly, the, the revolt was cruelly suppressed. End of story. Here's the point, guys. After the Bar Kokhba revolt's failure in 135 CE, the rabbis, Chazal, you see forth the Talmud, put a very strong emphasis on stop calculating when the end of days comes because it's dangerous. You do that, you're going to end up with hysteria on these movements that are based on ideas that, no, it's not taught, the time is not ready yet. And you're going to end up disillusioning the people, you're going to end up with a disaster, which is exactly what happened in the days of Bar Kokhba. So here's my question, guys. We begin with this. If after the fall of Bar Kokhba and Beitar, Beitar was the last stronghold of Bar Kokhba, the Jews began to see not so smart to calculate the end, don't get involved in these mass messianic movements. Why suddenly in the 16th century do we see a messianic movement that is going to capture the hearts and minds of a very large percentage of the Jewish people, including some of the greatest rabbis of the time? Didn't we just say that the Jews went easy now on this messianic calculations? What explains the runaway success of Shabtai Tzvi? And even more astonishingly, what is going to explain the success to a certain degree of the movement even after he is revealed to be a false messiah and he dies? For the next few hundred years, as we're going to see, there will be Jews who still believe in him. This is a crazy story. It's mind-blowingly interesting. So let's take a look at the biography of Shabtai Tzvi. Today we're going to go over the outlines of the story and begin to discuss why he was so popular, why he succeeded initially, and what happened after his death, the afterlife of Shabtai Tzvi. So the first thing we always ask is, First of all, this is an image of Shabtai Tzvi that is the most commonly accepted image of Shabtai Tzvi, except that he may not have looked like that. There are a number of portraits of him. But first I want to ask, how do we know what we know? In this class, we're also interested not only in history, but a word we keep using, historiography, the writing of Jewish history. So here we need to stop and look at yet another one of the extremely famous historians that we are discussing over the course of this course who changed the way we write and study Jewish history. The name of this man is one I want you to remember. He's one of the greatest minds of the 20th century who created a revolution in Jewish historiography. I'm curious if any of you have heard of him, Gershom Shalom. He died not that long ago. Gershom Shalom was a giant in the field of Jewish history. But not so much standard Jewish history. He created a whole new field in Jewish historiography. And if you know what he studied, you will know why the statement is so true. Martin Buber, another famous Jewish thinker, said about Gershom Shalom, all of us have students, schools, but only Gershom Shalom has created a whole academic discipline. What do we mean by that? Gershom Shalom was a man born early 20th century in Germany. He was born to a completely assimilated family. His family had no religious identity. His father was extremely assimilationist. But Gershom Shalom, as a young man already, seeing the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany, began to explore his Jewish roots and began to be interested in Jewish history and Jewish identity. But he also not only studied Hebrew. His family didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't know Hebrew. They didn't go to shul. He not only began to study the Hebrew language and Jewish history, he turned his attention to a field that had been almost completely ignored since Jews started writing history in a modern way in the 19th century. Now, what am I talking about? What area of Jewish thought had been almost entirely ignored and was limited to small circles of students studying this topic in places like Jerusalem? Not philosophy, not philosophy, but anybody? What's the most esoteric of Jewish subjects? Kabbalah. 
Kabbalah was something that was limited to circles of like part of Kabbalist and Sfat of Jerusalem. You had a little yeshiva somewhere. But the idea of Kabbalah played a crucial role in Jewish history was something that no one believed, no one discussed, no one thought about. Why? Who remembers what we said about the first people to write and study Jewish history in the modern period, beginning in the late 18th century? What kinds of Jews were now writing Jewish history textbooks and Jewish history articles and searching the Jewish past? They were, for the most part, more assimilated, less religious, in fact, sometimes anti-religious Jews from Germany, from the West. And what that meant is when they're writing Jewish history, they're going to ignore subjects that they don't like. So for example, Hasidut is not a particularly popular subject for a German historian who is a reformed Jew and does not like traditional Judaism. So if they write about Hasidut, it will be to denigrate them. Another thing that Hasidim actually liked and that they studied was Kabbalah. And Kabbalah, mysticism, which is a huge topic and would take us a whole year to discuss what is Jewish mysticism, but we're going to keep it as Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It's the esoteric study of Judaism. It's the secrets, not only buried in the Torah, but the secret of how God connects to human beings here in this world. Gershom Shalom says, wait a minute, what's this Kabbalah all about? And he devotes his entire life to the study of Kabbalistic ideas and to making the radical argument that Kabbalah is not only important in Jewish thought, but that Kabbalah, listen to this, played a leading role in shaping the events of Jewish history. No one before had ever said that. No one before had ever maintained that. And through his massive scholarly accomplishments, Gershom Sholem becomes a revolutionary in Jewish historiography. And he puts Kabbalah on the map. To this day, the study of Kabbalah is, as my professor liked to say, one of the sexiest subjects in Jewish history. You study Kabbalah, you can go to, I went to Columbia, there were like three courses on, on Kabbalah. Madonna was into Kabbalah, is into Kabbalah. Where does this come from, the popularization of Kabbalah in popular culture? Trace its roots back to the scholarly Gershom Sholem. Now, Gershom Sholem is controversial. For a man who devotes his life to the study of Kabbalah, it's very interesting to note that Gershom Sholem himself is a kind of revolutionary, anti-religious, not observant at all, and yet he devotes his life to the study of a subject that the most religious Jews spent their lives studying. Gershom Shalom, based on some of his biographers today, seems to have been a kind of revolutionary who looked at Kabbalah as something that was so radical that it could break with the traditional Jewish world and the traditional Jewish community. And that explains why our number one source for the life and times of Shaftai Tzvi is this amazing, massive volume that's over a thousand pages that Gershom Shalom wrote on Shaftai Tzvi. It's actually called Shaftai Tzvi, The Mystical Messiah. You know I often recommend books to read. I hesitate to say, go out and get this, because you're going to kill me. It's a 1,000 pages plus. But if you're fascinated by the book, and if you want to just dip into it and read detail upon detail upon detail with extraordinary uh, suggestions and theories that Gershom Shalom comes up with in this book, go for it. Let me know when you finish, two years from now. But Shatta, we actually had to read this in graduate school. None of us read the whole thing. We cheated and dipped into it because it's massive. And just the footnotes alone could take you years to explore. But this is one of his major accomplishments. And to this day, it's regarded as one of his, you know, he wrote many um, magisterial books. Shaktai Tzvi is regarded as maybe his crowning achievement, Gershom Shalom, that is. So what do we learn from Shaktai Tzvi the book, as well as, let's go back to this portrait for a moment. The reason that we know so much about Shabtai Tzvi, and this might be a clue to answering the big question we began with, why was he so successful, is that this portrait and others like it do not necessarily come from what Jews put out, but rather one of the astonishing things about Shabtai Tzvi and the whole story is that not only the Jewish world was wrapped up in it, but the non-Jewish world as well. Muslims and Christians in Europe were completely blown away by the story. And what do we have in the 16th century that we did not have before? We have newspapers. 
and newspapers, 16th century version of newspapers published by Nachos are going to picture, going to depict Shabtai Tzvi throughout the whole story and they're going to write articles and thousands of Christians as well as Muslims and Jews are following with bated breath the story of Shabtai Tzvi. So what is the story of Shabtai Tzvi? Who is he? Let's take a look at his bio. You can follow along not only here but on the sheet I gave you has the basic outlines of his life. Now notice that this portrait which says I wish we had Le Miriam Levre. Oh, you here we have a French. Please. Miss Beta. Oh, I love that French accent. Right, le vrai portrait, which means the real. Now wait, I just showed you another picture. It doesn't look at all like him. Everybody thinks they have the real portrait. We'll never know what he really looked like. Ah. Born in the town of Smyrna. Mm-hmm. And this is at the age of 40. Did he actually look like that? We shall never know. So let's take a look. We know that he was born in Smyrna. Another name for Smyrna is Izmir. It's, I believe, the second largest city in Turkey. Now, here's Istanbul, which we're all familiar with, formerly Constantinople. Izmir is here. What do you notice immediately? It's what? along the water, it's right? The earth, it's it's, it's a port there, city. You know? It's a port city. And Shaktan Tzvi is born to a family of... Well, here's an interesting question. Was he Sephardic or was he um, Ashkenaz? I have seen different reports and doing a little more research for this Turkey. class. Oh, so you think Turkey? It turns out that while we were, most people regard him as Sephardic, and I did see one source calling him Ashkenaz, the truth is neither. His family was originally Romaniot. Anybody know who the Romaniot Jews were? I may have mentioned this in an early class. The myth in Jewish history is that there are only two ethnic types of Jews. There are Ashkenazim and there are Sephardim. But it turns out that there are a number of communities that are neither Sephardic nor Ashkenaz. I probably mentioned this in a Jewish history class. If you were seniors, you might remember. One of the communities that's neither Ashkenaz nor Sephardic, because they predate that split, are the native Jews of Greece, who have a very ancient history. They are called Romanio Jews. And it would seem, based on the available evidence to us, that Shabtai Tzvi was actually a descendant of a Romaniot family. So he was technically neither Sephardic nor Ashkenaz, although most people would call him Sephardic because he lives in the Ottoman Empire, right? And the, fa and the communities had blended, and no doubt he maintained Sephardic customs. But the, to be perfectly accurate, he was of Romaniot descent. Now, what happens with Shabtai Tzvi, if you follow along in his biography here, it seems that as a young man, I'll add a little more details to his uh, life, he was very handsome. He had a very nice voice. He would sing in the synagogue, and everybody thought he had a beautiful voice. He was also very smart, and as you see, he becomes a scholar. He apparently was well-versed in the Talmud, but he was especially a student of and attracted to the study of Kabbalah. But not just any Kabbalah, and I know we simply throw out those words Kabbalah, but anybody here want to give us a definition of what Kabbalah is? I said it a moment before, but when you think of Kabbalah, what do you think of? Shimon Bar Yochai. We think of Shimon Bar Yochai, who created, tradition says that he created the, what? The Zohar. Zohar. So most people associate Zohar with Kabbalah, correctly so, but most people, when they think of Kabbalah, that is Vega did, Zohar is Kabbalah. The Zohar is but one of many books of the Kabbalah. There are different schools of the Kabbalah. And here we need to stop and discuss something that is so important in Jewish history and so important to understanding the story of Shabtai Tzvi. Many of you are familiar with the greatest Kabbalist of the 16th century, a man by the name of Isaac Luria, a.k.a. the Arizal. The Arizal, who was associated with the city of Tzfat. And some of you may know that the Arizal was the leader of a circle, a chug, a circle of Kabbalists who were centered in Safa, the city of Safa at Tzfat, in the 16th century. And he becomes a great popularizer of a particular kind of Kabbalah called after his name, Lurianic Kabbalah. Rav Isaac Luria is his name. He is a fascinating individual. He never wrote a single book. His students popularized his ideas, including most famously Rav Chaim Vital. To this day, if you go to Tzfat, you can visit his beautiful synagogue. You can see the mikveh. You know, the boys always tell me they went to the freezing cold mikveh, and you know, they're waiting for some spiritual miracle to happen. But in any case, he is the greatest Kabbalist of the day, and he lives 15th century. Tell me, what is the greatest crisis to occur to the Jewish people, Sephardic people? 
the Inquisition followed by the expulsion no. that we spoke at length from about. Spain. Uh, from, Spain. from Spain. Jews in 1492 expelled from Spain. Many of them make their way, they make their way to other parts of the Ottoman Empire, including Palestine, including Edith Yisrael. And there you have a circle of Kabbalists in Scott. What is so beautiful and amazing about Luriana Kabbalah, this is how I get my students' attention. Guys, today we're going to learn Kabbalah. It's like, ooh, so exciting. Then they're like, wait, maybe not as exciting as we thought. Because we think that Kabbalah is like this mystical, magical stuff, and no one's allowed to study it until they're 40, which is a total myth, by the way. The ideas of Luria Kabbalah are very powerful and very beautiful. No reason we shouldn't explore them. We need to understand the context here for Shabtai Tzvi. What is Luriana Kabbalah? Very briefly, we're going to do the dummies, you know, dummies guide to Luriana Kabbalah. We have a problem, guys. Jews are suffering. It's 1492. They've been thrown out. They're scattered all over in the exile. Ashkenazim as well, we know, have been suffering throughout the medieval period, well into the early modern period. They're going to be expelled from England and France and so on. Jews are in exile, they're all over. How do we understand this? It's so terrible. Isaac Luria comes along and gives a beautiful Kabbalistic explanation to the exile. He has this amazing Kabbalistic theory, again, based on his deep study of the esoteric secrets of Judaism and the Torah, that when God created the world, he created the world, he was perfect, but in order to make room for the world, after all, God is so great, he fills the entire world. He did something called simsum. He withdrew into himself, left space for the world, and he created the world as this perfect vessel of holiness. What happened when Adam sinned, Adam and Chava? Well, this beautiful vessel that contains all the sparks of holiness broke, it shattered, and the sparks of holiness that were contained in this vessel scattered all over the world. Are we beginning to see a theme here? Says Isaac Luria, Galut seems to be terrible, it is. And yet, and yet, within Galut, there is very the sparks of redemption. There are sparks of holiness throughout the world, and we Jews, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to collect these sparks of holiness that are found in the world of Koshaf and the world of darkness, that are found all over, collect them, and that means that every Jew, you know what Luriana Kabbalah is so exciting, why it's so exciting? I tell my students, Luriana Kabbalah says that each and every one of us are magicians. We are supermen and women. We have the power to redeem the sparks of holiness that are found in this dark, ugly, dangerous, sad world that we live in. We redeem it. That means each and every one of us plays a role in the ultimate messianic redemption of the world. What a gorgeous idea. And Luriana Kabbalah gave hope to Jews particularly Spartac Jews. Remember we said how Spartac Jews? Sparad. We are Spain. We are the aristocrats. We are the descendants of David HaMelech. And you're throwing us out of our ancestral home? So Luriana Kabbalah becomes very popular in the 16th century. Keep that in mind when we discuss what happens with Shabtai Tzvi. So Shabtai Tzvi is the students of Kabbalah. And now we know something, or think we know, and this is something that's a little bit dangerous to do. Guys, historians always have the itch when they look at, when they write biographies of people, and they see people who do things that are strange. We tend to say, let's give them a psychiatric diagnosis. If somebody did so and so in 1700, maybe he was mentally ill. And Gershom Sholom comes to the conclusion that Shabtai Tzvi must have been like some sort of manic, depressive, he must have suffered from some kind of severe mental illness because all the evidence indicates that he really did. But I want to sort of hesitate and say, while it seems intriguing and suggestive, the evidence, we'll never really know. But again, I think after what we do, you probably will come to agree, agree with uh, Gershom Sholm's diagnosis, his psychiatric diagnosis that Shabtai Tzvi was some kind of manic, depressive, and had experienced both mania and depressive incidents because he would go around as a young man with these manic illuminations where he would say he had these visions and that he was illuminated by God himself and he would perform very bizarre rituals, some of which we'll discuss in a moment, including rituals that contravened, that went against Jewish law. Most importantly, and most significantly, most frequently, he would pronounce the Shem HaMiforash. Okay, what's the Shem HaMiforash? Yeah, we know that God has many names, right? We say, Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melcholam. We say, Ado Shem, right? Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. But that's not how the words are spelled. We have a special name for God that we never pronounce. 
because that name is regarded as the name that only who pronounced when? The Kohen Gadol. I mean, Yom Kippur, right? That, only he was allowed to pronounce the famous name of God, the name that is never, ever, right? And when we look at the name of God, Yud and a He, and then a Vav and another He, Yud Ke Vav Ke, as we say, we know that we never pronounce it the way the Mikudot show. That is the shame of Mikodash. Well, he does exactly that. Shaftai Tzvi begins to pronounce the Shem HaMifodash, suggesting that he's, oh, that he's, yeah. What does that suggest? He's special. He's unique. Okay. And on the other hand, he had days where he would fall into this massive depression. He becomes a semi-recluse. No one can see him. And he claims that, oh, God's face is hidden from me. It's also at this time as a young man that he marries twice. He has two marriages as a young man, none of which are successful marriages. And from some of the evidence later, it seems that both of his wives claimed, complained that he never consummated the marriages. So something's a little off with our Shaftai's here. Nevertheless, fascinating, in 1648, he comes along and he declares himself the Messiah. I am the Mashiach. Now you might say, Hello, if you look at Jewish history, we haven't discussed this, but just briefly, there have been other crazies running around saying I'm the Mashiach. One of them was Jesus, starts a major world religion. We know that Bar Kokhba may or may not have been the Mashiach, done. Wait, this guy, they should have just slapped him out of town. And to a degree they did, because the rabbis in Smyrna will say, hmm, no, you're not the Mashiach, get out of here. And yet, he only becomes more popular. What the heck is going on here? He's going to travel through Greece and Turkey. It's not quite clear. We know where he traveled. It's not always quite clear the journey, when he went to where. Nevertheless, we know that he travels all over the Ottoman Empire, all over the Middle East. He is going to go to Turkey, Greece. He spends a lot of time in Salonika. Anybody know anything about Salonika? Salonika is what we call an ear the end Israel. It is one of the most important cities in, the, in Spartac history. Is it, so? it is in Greece. Salonika is a Greek city, but remember that the Ottoman Turks owned Greece in the 16th century, 17th century. And so Shaktai Tzvi <coughs> travels to Salonika. It has an enormous Spartac as well as a native Romanio Greek community. He spends time there. He gets disciples there as well. And there, too, he is going to do some very bizarre things. For example, guys, he is going to marry a physical woman, and he's also going to marry something, something spiritual. Let's talk about his new marriages. He is going to marry a woman named Sarah. Sarah has a very mysterious past. Somebody wrote a whole book about her, fictionalized, but still bizarre. She turns out she was an orphan. She was an orphan in the years of, uh, why was she orphaned? Tach v'tat. So here, I don't think I have it here yet, so it later. Um, Sarah, what's tach v'tat? Anybody know Gzero tach v'tat? The Chmelnitsky massacres of 1648-49? Okay, Ashkenaz history. Notice how we're connecting Spartak and Ashkenaz history in very interesting ways. Six, not our bill. 1648-49, a rebellion takes place in Poland. Very briefly, the Polish Jewish community in the 17th century was the largest Ashkenaz community in the world. Why? Poland had been a place that invited Jews. Ashkenaz Jews had been expelled from Western Europe throughout the Middle, Middle Ages, but the Poles, who own estates, listen carefully, in the Ukraine, Poland owns the Ukraine by the 17th century. They need Jews to run their estates because the Polish aristocrats are busy partying in Paris. And so they invite Jews to come and run these large estates. We call this the Arenda system. Don't worry about the details. Bottom line, the Jews are flourishing, except we have a problem. The Ukrainians, who are essentially owned by Poles, hate the Poles and hate the Jews who work for the Poles. And in 1648, a guy by the name of Chmelnitsky revolts against the Poles and in the process of trying to throw the Poles out and set up an independent Ukraine, what does he do? He attacks the Jews because the Jews are viewed as the enemy. They work for the Poles, ergo, they are our enemy as well. And in a series of events that are so horrible, this is like the Holocaust before the Holocaust, 
Thousands of Jews are killed. Again, debates about the numbers of Jews. Nevertheless, more than 300 Jewish communities are demolished, destroyed, and the Ashkenaz Jews go into sort of crisis mode now. Sarah, this woman, Sarah, Sarah, was an orphan who was orphaned in Tachvatat. Some stories indicate she may have been sent to a convent, a Catholic convent, and then she escapes. And she has a very checkered past. Other evidence indicates that when she gets to Livorno in Italy, she's a prostitute. And Shaktan Svi marries her. She comes out one day and says, I am destined to be the wife of the Messiah. Shaktai Tzvi hears about this woman who's somewhere in Italy at the time and says, oh, she must be my beloved. Perfect. And he marries her. Now you're going to say, wait, she's a prostitute, probably. Very checkered past. Like, what? No. Zatka picks her. Who knows why? Who knows their Navi? And who knows why, Kabbalistically, it's actually a great move on his part to marry this woman who may have had this very checkered past. Where do you see in Navi a prophet who actually is commanded to do the same thing to show that just as God is so faithful to Jewish people that even in the faith that the Jewish people are not faithful to him, he will always stick by you. So the Navi Hoshea takes a wife who it seems, according to the sources, huge debate by the Mufarshim, what exactly she was, but I'll keep peep shot. She was a loose woman. She may well have been a zona. He marries this kind of woman with loose morals because Hashem wants to teach the very, very beautiful lesson that no matter what we do, no matter how we go straying after others, God will always stick with us. Says in his twisted, bizarro mind, Shav Tzvi is, oh, Hoshea marries a loose woman? Perfect. I'm going to marry a loose woman too. And apparently the Sarah was, may have been crazy, but she's beautiful. She's charismatic. And the two of them today make this like, they, they make this like messianic power couple. And they begin to attract more and more followers. Shaktai Tzvi uses his deep and profound knowledge of Kabbalah to attract people to his movement. And whether he is in Salonika or Constantinople, more and more Jews begin to get attracted to this message. Now remember, Tach v'tat in the background, suffering of the Jews in 1648-49. Remember Lurianic Kabbalah, we're in exile, but there's a reason for it. The sparks of holiness are getting redeemed. File that away. What happens? He eventually arrives in Egypt via Israel. And there, his life is going to take on a new turn. In fact, 1665 is when Gershom Shalom and others say, new chapter where what was a fairly limited messianic movement, Sephardic Jews, the Ottoman Empire, different, attracted to his charismatic persona, he's declaring and doing all kinds of interesting things. Oh, wait, I forgot. What else? Who else did he marry? Guys, he marries a Sefer Torah. He marries a Sefer He has a ceremony performed, a ritual, in which he says, I am, he calls himself the Ein Sof, which is a capitalist term for really God, for the infinity, and he says, I am on a spiritual level. I need to marry a Torah. Again, in a symbolic fashion. But guys, that's bizarre. And some of the rabbis are freaking out. Other Jews are very intrigued. Wait, what's going on? So in 1665, there's a turning point in his life when he eventually gets to Palestine. Remember I told you that he has these kind of manic depressive episodes? So it seems that it bothered him. And he wanted to be cured of those times when he was reclusive and he couldn't face people. So what does he do? He travels to a man by the name of Nathan, Nathan of Gaza. And here is where we see the dynamic duo of Natan, Nathan of Gaza. Now, Gaza, you will know down south, Gaza, right, where all the problems and the rockets are flying. Gaza, at the time in the 17th century, was a very large, down in the south of the Egyptian border, was, had a very large and flourishing Jewish community. Nathan of Gaza was a very fascinating man. He was brilliant. Apparently knew half of Shas, half of the entire Talmud Baal Peh. He was also a mystic, but he also seems to have been a very clever um, PR. You know, he did public relations before there was something called public relations. And he was somebody who saw in Shaktai Tzvi his ticket to fame and success. 
he has a reputation as somebody who's an expert in Kabbalah, and Talmud Chacham, and maybe even somebody who has unique powers. Shaktesvi travels to him, apparently because he wanted Nathan of Gaza to heal him from his depressive episodes. Instead, Nathan of Gaza says, you're not going to believe this, but I had visions proclaiming that soon you're going to come along and be the Messiah. Not only is there nothing wrong with you, you are the Messiah. And Nathan becomes like his Navi and his prophet. Nathan also says, by the way, he points to a book of Kabbalah that he had discovered, written by an ancient famous Kabbalist, that actually predicted the coming of Shaktai Tzvi. The only problem is, now we know today, he wrote the book himself, <laughs> pretended that it was some ancient book of Kabbalah, but used that to convince others. He was also, by the way, supported by a wealthy father-in-law. So he had the ability to run around with Shaktai Tzvi and create this messianic excitement. By the way, another thing that Shaktai Tzvi used to tell people is that, I know how to fly. And when people say, oh, can you demonstrate? He says, you're not worthy, unfortunately, so I can't show you that I can fly. He also, in the midst of this messianic excitement, declared one day, you know, that fast that we call Shiv Asar B'Tammuz, Shiv Asar B'Tammuz, the 70th day of Tammuz, that commemorates the beginning of the destruction of the Second Temple. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore because I am the Messiah. And he points to something else that's fascinating. He says, and by the way, historians are still debating today if it's actually true or not, but let's assume that it's true. Guess when I was born? I was born on, anybody know when the Midrash, when Chazal tell us is in the fascinating Midrash, which is why we do certain things on a certain day? When is the Mashiach traditionally supposed to be born? On Tisha B'Av. Wait, on Tisha B'Av? The ninth of Av is the day of the destruction of the temple. So what? But we all know, we believe, Hashem Akdim Rufu'al Ufnei HaMakan, Midrash says very beautifully that on the day of the destruction, the seeds of redemption are already planted. And that is why there is a fascinating custom in Sephardic communities that after Chatzot, by the way, in general, after Chatzot, right, at the midpoint of the day in Tish Abab, there are certain halachot that we're no longer so stringent on. There's also a difference between Sephardic and Ashkenaz custom. But for example, Ashkenazim, I don't know about Sephardim, we don't sit on chairs until Chatzot. But after a Chatzot, wait, the day is happy now? We can suddenly do things that we couldn't do. Yes, because we have this tradition that the seeds of redemption are planted on Tisha B'Av. So Shaktai Tzvi says, me, I was, I was born on Tisha B'Av. I'm the Messiah, my birthday. So maybe we should change these fast days to holidays. Maybe we no longer, maybe we should abrogate these fast days and turn them into. So what's going on here? Wait, is there any proof that he's born on Tisha B'Av? Uh, so again, if you read Gershom Shalom and all the footnotes, you will see that there may be, in fact, it may be, there may be a basis to this belief. Uh, but lots of people have wanted Tisha B'Av. It doesn't make you the Messiah. But nevertheless, given everything else that's going on, it seems to be suggested to so many people. Nathan of Gaza says, oh my God, the Messiah is here. He says, that Shavuot in 1665, he goes to the synagogue and publicly proclaims that he is, in fact, the official Messiah. And he says that within a year, Shaktai Tzvi is going to take the Turkish Sultan's crown because, wait, what's the missing piece of the puzzle here? If you're the Messiah, what are you supposed to be doing? You are supposed to bring the Jewish people back to Shivat Zion, the ultimate Shivat Zion, to their homeland. There's just a little problem. Who owns Palestine at the time? The Ottoman Sultan. So, in fact, uh, Shaktai Tzvi, and this is, of course, his downfall, as you probably know, Shaktai Tzvi, by declaring that he is the Messiah, by Nathan declaring publicly that he is the Messiah, and then in one year from now, he's going to place the crown of the Ottoman Sultan on his head, and he's going to bring back the Jews to Palestine. Essentially, that's declaring a revolt against the Ottoman Empire, right? And the Ottoman Sultan. Hold on to that. So the rabbis who begin to hear this in, in Palestine, in Jerusalem in particular, are furious. They threaten his followers with excommunication. Shaktai Tzvi recognized maybe Jerusalem's not the right place for me, and he leaves Jerusalem, travels again around the Ottoman Empire to cities uh, where you have large Jewish communities, and here is where things take a really bizarre turn. You would think, okay, so there are people who are gullible. There are people, guys, there were rabbis who believed in him. In fact, one of his biggest supporters was one of the wealthiest man, men in Aleppo. He was, uh, or from Aleppo, I should say, a very, very wealthy man in Cairo, 
whose name, Halabi, he was from the Aleppo Jewish community, he was so rich that he was like the tax farmer for the Ottoman Sultan, and he believes in Shabtai Tzvi, he's funding him, and as a result, Shabtai Tzvi becomes very powerful. So that's number one, Shabtai Tzvi has financial backing. Number two, there were rabbis who were convinced by Shabtai Tzvi. Number three, the news of Shabtai Tzvi spreads like wildfire, not just to Jews in the Ottoman Empire, but to Jews elsewhere. And so, we are going to see, take a look here, you have Shaktai Tzvi, you know, crowned as the Messiah, and Kabbalistic formulations here. Tikkun, Atere Tzvi, right, Shaktai Tzvi. Tikkun, he's going to repair the world. This is the advent of the Messiah. But here is what's so crazy. You have Jewish communities, now these, by the way, are woodcuts from non-Jewish newspapers. And sometimes news of Shabtai Tzvi reached Jewish communities via Christian accounts. The Christian world is beginning to say, wait, there's this guy running around. They're publishing stories about Shabtai Tzvi. And news reaches communities like Hamburg. Hamburg? Hamburg is a port city in Germany that has an Ashkenazi community, an interest story, a community of Sephardic merchants. And people are like, oh my god, Shabtai Tzvi is here. The Mashiach is coming. You would not believe what's going on. The, the, here you have a woodcut of Shabtai Tzvi blessing the Jews who come to the synagogue, and the Mashiach is giving them brachot, and they're all you know, thrilled to pieces. And you would not believe how thousands of Jews do something that is described by this fascinating woman who deserves an entire class on her own. We are lucky enough to have a diary written by a very famous Jewish woman, famous today. She is a 17th century Jewish woman named Gluckel of Hamlin. I don't have her here on the sheet. So follow. This is a really not a picture of her, but of a granddaughter who sat for a portrait. This is Gluckel of Hamlin. I have, I have a marker. I'm going to spell it. Gluckel is Yiddish for Mazal, like her name would be Glick. Glick, right? Glick. Right. Oh, right here. Okay. okay. I just don't know if this is good for me. It should be. Okay. So we have, well, we have Gluckel. Ah, doesn't really. Gluckel of Hamlin. She is such a fascinating woman, and I would recommend, if you can, dipping into her book, she wrote an autobiography, which is really an ethical will. Guys, she was married at like 14. She had a gazillion children. Her husband dies when she's a young woman. She is a major businesswoman. She was a millionaire. She loses her money. She gains her money. She travels to fears. She is amazing. She is learned. She is rich. She is poor. She is rich again. She remarries. Her no good next second husband loses all of her money. But we are so fortunate that she wrote a book about her life. Why am I mentioning Gluckel of Hamlin in the story of Shaktai Tzvi? Because here is where you see the connections. In her autobiography, this book of Hamlin describes how her father-in-law, you know, the way it went is we got married very young. You're a teenager. You live in your in-law's home until your husband is ready to go off on his own. She's living at her wealthy father-in-law. And her father-in-law one day hears about Shabtai Tzvi. He ups and sells all of his household belongings. He buys a bunch of preserved herring fish because they're going on a journey to Palestine. And he's not the only one. So from Gluckel of Hamlin's autobiography, we have literary evidence, which we find in other places as well, that thousands of Jews are making preparations to go to Palestine under the flag of the Messiah. And all kinds of rumors are flying around town. There are rumors that a ship was found in Scotland. Scotland! We are the soldier, the, the sailors on the ship speak Hebrew. They're flying the 12 flags of the tribes, the, the, uh, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're going to pick up Jews and take them to Palestine, Scotland. So there were all kinds of crazy rumors flying around. Ashkenaz Jews and Sephardic Jews alike are inflamed with this messianic passion. We have descriptions. Again, Gluckel of Hamlin and others that tell us the Jews came to shul, they decorated the shul with flowers. They, they're doing mass tshuva. Everybody's coming and they're crying and they're laughing and they're celebrating and they're, they're doing tshuva because this is it. This is the end of days. Christians are writing in the newspapers, oh my goodness, the Jewish Messiah, what does this mean for us? The Pope sent, oh, the Pope sends an emissary. The, the Pope in Italy says, what the heck's going on here? The Jewish Messiah, he wants to know what's going on. Everybody's writing stories. Everybody's going crazy. Oh, so wait, now, now. 
One of my mentors at, uh, in graduate school at Columbia is a fabulous historian by the name of Elisheva Kalbach, Elisheva Jaffan Kalbach. Elisheva Kalbach is a religious woman who was a full professor at Columbia. She's one of the greatest writers in Jewish history today. Love her to pieces. She's amazing. Her husband is a Rosh Kolel. And she wrote the definitive book on the anti sabatian movements. The problem in my presentation is it seems, I'm telling you, everybody's on board. Not everybody was on board. In fact, another fabulous book, if you want to read, is a book by Elisheva Kabach called The Pursuit of Heresy, in which she discusses how a very famous rabbi by the name of Rav Chajiz went on the warpath against Shabtai Tzvi. Unfortunately, not everybody went along, and some people were hoodwinked by Shabtai Tzvi, even rabbis. And we need to ask why. Why are very smart people who themselves knew Kabbalah, why are they hoodwinked by Nathan of Gaza? And this is like a million dollar question. Why wasn't everybody like Rabbi Yaakov Chajiz seeing through this guy and saying he's a mentally ill sicko and we should stop right now? So that's a question that I want to hold till the end of our discussion. So there were rabbis. The Pursuit of Heresy gives you a very good overview of the anti sabatian We're going to call this the Sabatian movement, a.k.a. Shabtai Tzvi. When you hear the word Sabatian, we mean Shabtai Tzvi. So here's what happens, guys. News spreads like wildfire. And while there is opposition, he seems to be growing more and more popular. But then, let's get back to the initial point that we made. Shabtai Tzvi, by declaring that he is the Messiah, is essentially declaring war on the Ottoman Empire. So in 1666, Shabtai Tzvi arrives in Constantinople a.k.a. today, Istanbul. Now, Constantinople is the seat of the Ottoman Empire. There's some intriguing evidence that he may have been forced to, to go there. Already he has trouble. But in any case, immediately when he gets to Constantinople, the Sheni Lamel, the vizier of the Ottoman Empire, has him arrested. Why does he have him arrested? Well, duh, you're walking around saying you're the Messiah, you're a threat to our empire, we're going to arrest you. It doesn't stop the movement. You would think, okay, the guy gets arrested, it's all over him. Uh-uh, it gets even crazier because it's 1666. Hold that date. Hold that date. He's brought, his followers are convinced that the redemption is near at hand. There were messianic calculations based on some interpretations of the Zohar and other mystical texts that, in fact, 1666 was going to be the year of redemption. And believe it or not, we're going to see that even Christians believe that 1666 had significance. We'll talk about that later. Now, eventually, he will be brought before the sultan, and here's where he gets into real trouble. By the way, the backdrop this is fascinating. There was another messianic sort of pretender who comes from Poland and says, i got to meet with you because I have a tradition. Back in Poland, we're talking about the Messiah coming, and we're not sure it's you. And he meets Shabtai Tzvi. There's some evidence that Shabtai Tzvi wanted to have him killed. He runs away, and now he goes and rats on Shabtai Tzvi to the sultan, and he says, this guy's name was Nehemiah. Don't worry about his name. He says, this guy, Shabtai Tzvi, is really a revolutionary. He wants to take over. He thinks he's going to have your crown, and so you better do something about him. Well, the sultan calls Shabtai Tzvi in for an audience and says, you've got a couple of choices here. You want to prove that you're Messiah? No problem. We're going to have you stand up and have a barrage of arrows shot at you. If you're the Messiah, you'll survive. Or you can choose no death and we'll strangle you. Or convert to Islam. Immediately, Shabtai Tzvi chooses to place the Muslim turban on his head and he converts to Islam. One would think, end of the Zaro story here. No. Because Shabtai Tzvi, once he is Muslim, his followers, many of them say, oh, don't worry. This is part of the Lurianic messianic process of, listen to this, descending to the depths of evil to redeem the sparks of holiness that are found within the world of Tumah, that are found within the world of Kosha. And guys, can you guess here, if you're going to be a clever Kabbalist, who would you point to as an example from our tradition of someone who herself descended into the depths of Tum'ah to redeem the Jewish people. Who are we talking about? Who? Never. She had to marry a non-Jew. She had to live with a non-Jew, and yet through her comes the redemption. Esther Hamaka becomes, in a twisted, sick, perverted way, a kind of model for Shabtai Tzvi and his followers of a deeply mystical, Kabbalistic part of the redemption story. you got to get to the depths of Tumah in order to achieve the heights of holiness. Look how clever this is. And so, you're not going to believe this. We're almost at the end of our time. But when Shabtai Tzvi converts to Islam, the story is not over. 
there will be a few hundred families, follow along here, who follow him into conversion to Islam. They become Jews, a sect. They are called the Dunmeh. Guys, this is really going to blow your mind. They exist to this day, as you're going to see. And the Dunmeh become a cult who are technically Muslim on the outside, but who only marry within each other, and who believe that Shabtai Tzvi is the Mashiach and who's going to come and redeem them again. Wow. to this day. Now, again, there's debate, yes, there's debate about how many. They live in Turkey. They originally were in Salonika, but when the Turks, later in, a little bit later in history, uh, take over, uh, I should say, the, 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 uh, the Dunmeh family, along with many others, are expelled. When Greece becomes a non-Muslim country and wins its independence from Turkey, they're going to expel many of the Muslims, including the Dunmeh, who make their way to Istanbul. We're going to talk more about them next time because the story is completely mind-blowing about what happens to them. There was some debate about how many uh, debates are superior. Are they still around? I think there are still a few based on the evidence. It seems like there are still a few hundred families. They may not even remember what they originally believed, but they're still the descendants of these Jews who believe in Shafet's feet. Now, what happens? Initially, Shaketsky is treated very well in prison. He's given a, a stipend. And so many Jews around the world who couldn't give up their belief at the Shaketsky, they said, this is it. Any minute now, he's going to take over the sultan, and wow, we're going to have the Messiah. But instead, the sultan gets very nervous because Shaketsky, it seems, is still associating with Jews. He still seems to have been doing certain Jewish practices. He eventually gets sent from one place to another. He eventually ends up exiled to some place, we think, in Albania today, current day Albania, Montenegro. And he dies there. He dies there. Okay, end of story. Now everyone knows it's not true. Guess what? For the next 200 years plus, the belief in Shabtai Tzvi goes underground, but not only the Dunmeh, good, religious, seemingly standard Jews throughout the Ashkenaz community are going to continue to believe that Shabtai Tzvi is the Mashiach. And this raises the million dollars. Seriously? The guy not only converts to Islam, he dies. We don't believe in dead messiahs. That's Christianity. What are we talking about? And wait, wait till you see what we do next time. Not only will there be some, you know, Jews caught up in this who believe in it secretly, we're going to see that the greatest rabbi, one of the greatest rabbis of the 18th century, 100 years after Shabtai Tzvi died, is accused of believing in Shabtai Tzvi, and this is going to split the Jewish world in half. So the story of Shabtai Tzvi has an insane, exciting, dramatic, controversial it? afterlife. Tune in next week when we look at the uh -huh. afterlife of Shabtai Tzvi. Uh -huh. Thank you. There's a word here, uh, antinomian. Oh, antinomian, yes. Antinomian means anti-halachic, anti-traditional. Shabtai Tzvi, we're going to talk more about this. I should have maybe said a little bit. Shabtai Tzvi does special averot. For example, you know what Sabatians will do? And even after Shabtai Tzvi dies, let's say it's Tisha B'Av. You're not allowed to eat, right? They'll fast the whole day. Ten minutes before the fast is over, five minutes, they'll eat three cherries. You fast the whole day, but you break the fast three minutes over antinomian behavior. Why? Because you want to show we're still Jewish, we keep halakha, but no, the Mashiach came already. He's going to do other things. In his last year in prison, he has a carbon Pesach brought to him on Pesach, and he eats, he roasts a lamb, he eats the fat, the chelev, which is like a big fat no-no, which is Yechayev Karet. He eats all this stuff that you're not supposed to eat, and he actually makes the bracha, listen to this, Baruch atah shalom keinu melcholam, matir asurim. Uh -huh. Pun, right? Matthias means he frees those who are in prison. It could also mean he permits that which is a sore. Craziness. What's going on? To be continued. To be continued. Oh, yes. Of course. Okay. Okay. It looks like it is. Oh, good. Is this